here. I just want to let you know about a few announcements. One is you can probably see the food and the paper goods up here. Our, ch our challenge is to collect a thousand items by the end of the month. We started this in June. All of the items go to the CCM ministry. And so next time you're at the grocery store, grab some canned meat or canned vegetables or diapers or peanut butter, toilet paper, whatever you see, and bring it next Sunday. I also wanted to announce that the Presbyterian men are having uh, hot dogs and burgers with trimmings plus chips for ten dollars uh, next Saturday, Saturday the 13th from 11 until they run out and that's at Second Presbyterian on Dale Earnhardt Boulevard in Kannapolis. And if you're not familiar, uh, Presbyterian men is a group of men from all of the Presbyterian congregations in the area that get together to do mission work. And the dogs and burgers, the money they earn is going to Children's Hope Alliance. So uh, just wanted to invite you and make you aware of that. If you have questions about that, you can ask Chris. Um, or maybe Ed next week, what? No, no. I said if they have questions, they can ask you. Okay, you go, you've got tickets, okay. All right. Also, uh, on the back table in the Narthex, we have a few of these bags. These are left over from Vacation Bible School. The children packed them. Inside, we studied the loaves and the fishes. Uh, the story where Jesus multiplied the loaves and the fishes, and there were five loaves. So in the bag is five granola bars and two fish. And so in the bag are two bags of goldfish and a bottle of water as well as the Bible story and a little note from the children. And I encourage the children to take these home and to give them to people that you see that are hungry, maybe the unhoused. And many of the children weren't even aware that they were hungry people. So, uh, but we had some extras. Feel free to get one. Just keep it in your car. And when you see somebody, you can give it out. Are there other announcements? Let us prepare our hearts to worship God.
Please stand. call to worship. The earth is the Lord's. God's greatness is wondrous to behold. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. May God's ways be known upon the earth. So that his salvation become known among all the nations. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. Let the heavens celebrate. Let the earth rejoice. God is a God of mercy and of grace. Therefore, in humility, let us confess our sins together, first using the prayer of confession that's on the screen, and then there'll be a moment for silent confession. Let us pray together. God of all nations, 
We praise you that in Christ the barriers that have separated humanity are torn down. Yet we confess our slowness to open our hearts and minds to those of other lands, tongues, and races. Deliver us from the sins of fear and prejudice that we may move toward the day when all are truly one in Jesus Christ. Help us perceive the opportunities you place before us. We are often caught up in our own hopes, plans, and fantasies and crushed when they disappoint us. Forgive us when we are slow to see the open pathways you set before us. Open our eyes that we may accept the new life you offer us. And this show forth the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Hear our silent prayers. Many of you may not realize most of those words in that anthem were taken from the Statue of Liberty. They're in car, engraved there. And now we come to our Old Testament reading. I invite you to bow your heads for a prayer of illumination. O oh, gracious God, your word is precious to us. Open our hearts and our minds that we might hear what you want it to say to us this day. Fill us with your spirit and touch us with your grace. In Christ's name, amen. I'm reading from the Common English Bible various verses from Psalm 33. Listen for God's word. The Lord overrules what the nations plan. 
he frustrates what the peoples intend to do. But the Lord's plan stands forever. What he intends to do lasts from one generation to the next. The nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom God has chosen as his possession, is truly happy. The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees every human being. From his dwelling place, God observes all who live on earth. God is the one who made all their hearts, the one who knows everything they do. We put our hope in the Lord. He is our help and our shield. Our heart rejoices in God because we trust his holy name. Lord, let your faithful love surround us because we wait for you. This is the reading. Thanks be to God. This morning's New Testament lesson is from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8, verses 9 through 11. This is a translation from the message. Those who think they can do it on their own end up obsessed with measuring their own moral musser, but never get around to exercising it in real life. Those who trust God's action in them find that God's spirit is in them, living and breathing God. Obsession with self in these matters is a dead end. Attention to God leads us out into the open, a spacious, free life. Focusing on the self is the opposite of focusing on God. Anyone completely absorbed in self ignores God, ends up thinking more about self than God. That person ignores who God is and what he is doing, and God isn't pleased at being ignored. But if God himself has taken up residence in your life, you can hardly be thinking more of yourself than of him. Anyone, of course, who has not welcomed this invisible but clearly present God, the Spirit of Christ, won't know what we're talking about. But for you who welcome him, in whom he dwells, even though you still experience all the limitations of sin, you yourself experience life on God's terms. It stands to reason, doesn't it, that if the alive and present God who raised Jesus from the dead moves into your life, he'll do the same thing in you that he did in Jesus, bringing you alive to himself. When God lives and breathes in you, and he does as surely as he did in Jesus, you are delivered from that dead life. With his spirit living in you, your body will be as alive as Christ's. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. 
We just celebrated the 248th birthday of our great nation. And about this time, I was thinking, what am I going to preach on? And I began to think about the motto of our country. What is the motto of our country? You might think it's pull yourself up by your own bootstraps or you only live once. But in 1795, E Pluribus Unum was engraved on the coin currency. You see, in 1776, John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, and Thomas Jefferson were tasked with creating a seal and a motto for our nation. They worked with an artist whose first designs were rejected by Congress. After several images, committees, and debates, the Great Seal of the United States was approved in 1782. It shows an eagle gripping 13 arrows in one talon and an olive branch in the other, with his head facing the olive branch. In his mouth is a banner which says E Pluribus Unum, which is Latin and means out of many, one. That saying became the motto of our nation and was agreed upon by all three of the original committee, Adams, Franklin, and Jefferson. It appears on the back of the $1 bill as well as on the Kennedy half dollar. It is still on the front of the seal of the United States and used accordingly. But things change. At the beginning of the Civil War in 1861, M.R. Watkinson, a Pennsylvania clergyman, encouraged the placement of In God We Trust on coins at the war's outset in order to help the North's cause. Such language, Watkinson wrote, would place us openly under the divine protection. Though it was added to coins, it was not added to the increasingly common paper money. In God we trust. But then in the 1950s, there was a revival of that sentiment. In God we trust. At the beginning of the Cold War and in opposition to the secular communist in the Soviet Union. 94 years after its first appearance, in 1955, President Eisenhower signed a bill placing the phrase, In God We Trust, on all American currency. And the following year, Congress voted to make the phrase, In God We Trust, the official motto of the United States. Now recently, Princeton University historian Kevin Cruz has shown that religious language was not merely rhetoric against communism. In God We Trust effectively formed an alliance of conservative business leaders and Christians on the home front and linked faith, freedom, and free enterprise. But today, I don't want to emphasize that linking, whether it's good or not so good. As 21st century Christians of a pluralistic nation, we must acknowledge, whether we like it or not, all people of our nation do not trust in God. All leaders of our nation do not trust in God. But we, 21st century Christians, say that we do trust in God. 
In Psalm 33 that we read, I wanted to tell you a few verses from the message for Psalm 33. Verse 20 says, We're depending on God. He's everything we need. Listen again. It says, We're depending on God. He's everything we need. Now remember, that phrase was written a thousand years before Jesus was born. And yet, it's still true for many of us today. You know, we do really, we do rely on God. And in our dependence comes the truth that we are not an island to ourselves as individuals or as a country. Now, verses 21 and 22 in that psalm, say, it says, What's more, our hearts brim with joy since we've taken for our own his holy name. Love us, God, with all you've got. That's what we're depending on. Do you think that we are aware of how wide, how deep, how all-encompassing God's love for us really is? Maybe we need to be reminded of this. Maybe we need to remind others. You know, sometimes we are so blind to the joy that comes from God that we focus inward instead of outward. We become depressed, discouraged, and fearful. But we can depend on God. He is our rock. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul writes, Christ is our rock. I think of a rock as solid, as a firm foundation, as something we can count on. I want to tell you a story about a reporter and this hundred-year-old lady that he interviewed. David, a young journalist, visited Anna for an inter interview around the time of Anna's hundredth birthday, and he found her as sharp as a tack. He was impressed by her unwavering optimism and decided he wanted to get her perspective on the current state of our nation. Now, Anna had lost her older brother in the Spanish flu pandemic a few years before she was born, and this had shaped her early family life. Anna had seen this country go through many trials and triumphs over the years. She had witnessed many wars, the Great Depression, other economic hardships, political unrest, pandemics, and partisan division. But through it all, Anna maintained a steadfast faith in God. As they sat in David's cozy, in Anna's cozy living room, David asked, Anna, how do you stay so hopeful despite all the challenges facing our country? Anna smiled gently and replied, My dear, I've seen difficult times, yes, but I have also seen how God has always been faithful to our nation. Whenever we have faced adversity, there were always people who turned in prayer to God, seeking God's guidance and strength. And you know what? Every time, in ways big and small, I believe that God has intervened. David listened as Anna shared stories of past crises and how each time the country had found a way forward. Sometimes 
through unexpected events, sometimes through the sacrifice of many of its citizens, and other times through the courage and wisdom of its leaders. But Anna, David interjected, what about now? The problem seems so complex, and people are divided more than ever. Anna nodded knowingly. Yes, my dear, it may seem daunting, but I believe that as long as there are people who continue to pray and seek God's will, there is hope. Our country is like a ship, she said, navigating stormy seas. We may not always see the way forward clearly, but we trust in the captain who guides us. She paused, and then she continued. Trusting God with our country doesn't mean we sit idle and pray. It means that we pray and we do our part, being honest, kind, voting, and working for justice. But beyond our efforts, we also trust that God sees the bigger picture and works through the hearts and minds of people. David finished the interview And as he left Anna's house, he was deep in thought. She was inspiring, especially in a time when so many questioned the future of our democracy. He realized that trusting God with our country wasn't about blind faith, but about recognizing that in the midst of uncertainty, in the midst of culture wars, in the midst of contentious ethical battles, there may just be a greater plan at work, one that requires both faith and action from us. David was determined to never forget Anna, her optimism inspired him. Her faith inspired him. Her life inspired him. David began to seek out more stories of hope and resilience. He saw it as a mission to remind people in Anna's honor that even in the darkest times, there are always signs of God's presence. And I have one more story today. This one is about a high school science project. The girl who did this project, her name is Julie. And Julie Ackerman describes her final project this way. She said she and her friend built a stream table with lots of help from her dad. They built a long plywood box and lined it with plastic, and then filled it with sand. And at one end of the box, they attached a water hose. And at the other end of the box was a drainage hole. And they raised the end of the box that had the hose. And they turned on the water with just a little bit of pressure, and watched as the water created a path to the hole at the other end. The next part of the experiment was to place a big rock in that stream and watch how it changed the path of the water. They did it several times, and sometimes the water split and went on either side of the stream, and sometimes either side of the rock. Sometimes they put, when they put the rock in, the water went on one side or the other. Julie says that this stream table taught her as much about life 
as it did about earth science. She says, I learned that I can't change the direction things are going if I'm on the bank of the river. I have to step into the stream of life and stand there to divert the flow. Julie writes, I think that is part of what it means when we say Christ is called the rock. God placed Jesus in the stream of history to change its course. When we remain steadfast in Christ, abounding in the work of the Lord, God uses us to change the course of history through acts of obedience that turn others to him. We must become a rock ourselves in faith. We can change the stream of life by diverting the flow of hateful words, of misrepresentation, of lies, by pointing out the things we know to be true in this world of grace where things aren't black and white. And we Christians can live out the words in God we trust each and every day our whole lives long. Amen and amen. I invite you to stand and let us affirm our faith using a portion of the Declaration of Faith. Let us say what we believe together. God rules over both political and religious institutions. We must confuse neither with the kingdom of God. We must not equate the Christian faith with any nation's way of life or with opposition to the ideologies of other nations. We believe God sends us to work with others to correct the growing disparity between rich and poor nations, to achieve fair legislation justly administered and enforced, to make the operation of courts and penal institutions more just and human. We are charged to root out prejudice and racism from our hearts and institutions. We acknowledge God is at work here and now. Amen. We come to a time for our morning offering. Our ushers will pass the plates, but if you'd rather give electronically, in the pew in front of you is a pink card, and on it is a QR code. Feel free to use it to give electronically. Also this morning, Guy, uh, one of the children of our church, will be passing what looks like a green bag. And actually what that is, is an old-fashioned way of receiving the offering. Our church is over 200 years old, and this was something we found that was used years ago. And Guy is going to be receiving any money that goes to 10 cents a meal. All of that money collected will go to feed hungry people. Our morning offering.
please join me in our prayer of dedication. Thank you, God, for the opportunity to share in your creative and restorative work among people. Because you have blessed us, we have much to give. These offerings express our gratitude and our aspiration to be more fully your own loyal community. In Christ's name, amen. as we pray. Our Father in heaven, help us to honor your name. Come and set your kingdom so that everyone on earth will obey you as you are obeyed in heaven. Give us our food for today. Forgive us for doing wrong as we forgive others. Keep us from being tempted and protect us from evil. For you are the sovereign, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to stand. One of the things, are the words for Go Make a Difference on the screen? Yes, they are. Okay. <laughs> One of the things we have started doing, and it's not every week, but we believe that after we have worshipped God, that we are called to go and make a difference. So I invite you to stand and let us sing this twice. May the majesty of God be the light that guides you. May the compassion of Christ be the love that inspires you. And may the presence of the Holy Spirit be the strength that empowers you this day and forevermore. Amen. <laughs> <laughs>